for comrades who are here for the first time. Welcome everybody. My name is Roger Silverman. I'll be chairing today's meeting. Um, I would say just as we open, um, what's happened in recent weeks in Afghanistan obviously has worldwide repercussions. The rout of US and British imperialism marks a definitive point in world history, highlight, highlighting sharply the paradox of our times, the deepening and inescapable crisis of the ruling class on the one hand and the current desperate lack of a coherent socialist alternative. Of course, it represents a historic humiliation for American and British imperialism. A 20 year war costing billions of dollars, hundreds of US and British soldiers and thousands of Afghans lives, uh, subjecting the Afghan civilian population to indescribable hardship has ended with a definitive reversion to the status quo ante as it was in 2001, the tyranny of the dreaded Taliban. We did actually previously have some loose uh, can everybody mute themselves, please? Uh, we had some contact previously, very loosely, with an Afghani trade union leader, but he, of course, is not in a position to speak to us today. I believe he's in hiding. But while the voices of Afghan workers and trade unionists are for the moment silenced under the Taliban terror, we are very proud to welcome three Marxist activists from regions bordering Afghanistan, which are the home of millions of Afghan refugees. Hamid Khan lives in Baluchistan on the border of Afghanistan, an area which itself is under military occupation. He's a Marxist, a leading trade unionist, and a frequent writer for the Urdu fortnightly, Jodhra Jihad, or The Struggle, and also for the English language, Asian Marxist Review. Uh, Aman Kafa is, of course, a regular participant in WIN meetings. He's a leading member of the Worker Communist Party of Iran, the Hekmatist official line, and he's also an active trade unionist in uh, Britain. And Farooq Suraria is a Pakistani, a long-time socialist activist who has lived in Asia and in Europe, but more to the point, he's also lived in Kabul and has an intimate personal knowledge of the terrain. So between these comrades, they have a wealth of knowledge and a unique insight into the situation. Uh, they have kindly agreed to keep their opening remarks to a maximum of, maximum of 45 minutes between them to allow for extensive questions and uh, discussion. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to call first on, uh, is Hamid here? Uh, thank you, uh, Comrade Roger. Uh, hi, comrades. I'm feeling uh, really proud and prestigious to talk on Afghanistan perspective in front of uh, great uh, Marxist teachers and professional revolutionaries. Uh, first of all, uh, please accept my apology for my weak English language uh, as uh, it is neither a medium of teaching here in, edu in educational institutions and not spoken in society in general. So I may not uh, well convey my thoughts due to language barrier uh, to you comrades. So it needs uh, to analyze socio-economic and political development of Afghanistan on historical basis to, under to understand today's current situation of the country. But due to uh, some compulsions of time and space, we are bound to discuss the latest emerging situation in Afghanistan, uh, which has uh, swipe other, uh, other issues uh, from international political horizon. I would discuss briefly some main points which are of significant uh, importance in the context of the starting of new era on international scale. Yesterday, America marked the 20th anniversary of uh, the attack incident of 9-11 on Twin Tower. The 9-11 incident was uh, a pretext to assault on Afghanistan, Iraq, and the whole Middle East in general, with the aim of eradicating fundamentalism 
introduce, introducing democracy and development, a fabricated pretext to invade the sovereign countries centuries ago. But uh, as described by Comrade Trotsky, that the American imperialism is a giant whose feet are made of clay. So when she put it, foot uh, soldiers in Afghanistan poured $2.4 trillion, which is eight times bigger than the Pakistan's total economy, which doesn't need explanation that the huge amount went into the pockets of big companies of military war, war industrial complex. Eric Prince, the head of notorious security companies had and his killing mercenaries, corrupt government officials and warlords. Having 2,400 casualties and more than 10,000 injured personnel, American lost the war very disgracefully, leaving the unfortunate country in the midnight like a mice. Leaving shambles in hasty retreat, her uh, puppet president for the country, Ashraf Ghani, went on the same path, paved by his masters. This was not a normal war a defeat of a superpower in the war against the guerrilla militants of poorest country of the world, but it is the explicit demise of the new liberalism, not only in Afghanistan, but in the whole eastern region of the world. The words of Francis Fukuyama, end of the history, could have been seen in the deeds and practices of American imperialism in Russia, Afghanistan, and beyond in the whole third world after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Afghan puppet President Ashraf Ghani was the accumulated form and face of the neoliberalism in the region in general, while uh, specifically in Afghanistan. He was brought up, prepared, and nourished by imperialist educational institutions for a role he had to play for his uh, patrons. He remained an employee of imperialist financial institutions, the World Bank, for a decade. He was head of the structural ad adjustment program in Russia for years. He, he was assigned an assignment patronizing uh, madrasas, regional, uh, we, we, we call them uh, religious schools, the program uh, for America in Pakistan for five years. He was made finance minister of puppet Karzai uh, government to shape the Afghan economy on new liberal principles, a point of, a point of reference for other neighboring countries and for the whole world. At last, he was brought as president to exploit his uh, expertise that how to fix a failed state by his uh, theory, channelizing all the businesses to strengthen the, uh, the failing state. His fairy tales tips were in when, while the whole capitalist system is organically in severe recession and multi-dimensional multi, uh, decline. Due to, de due to decrease in rate of profit, the bankruptcy of financial institutions followed by sovereign defaults before COVID-19, there was an epic recession illustrating in almost uh, less than 2% rate globally. Shrinking markets and crashing uh, stock markets worldwide which has aggravated by COVID-19 crisis with the demolished chain of supply and orders, anyhow uh, with the uh, restoration in some uh, segments of supply chain, there is a temporary, temporary uh, hike in GDP growth in some sectors of the microeconomy, but uh, still a double dip and more severe recession is on the way approaching very fast. Unfortunately, Afghanistan is the target of American imperialism and her allies since then, when the working class and oppressed people of Afghanistan took the reins of their, failure, of their future in their own hands in a Bonapartist revolution in the country in April 
the spring of 1978 by toppling a clown and cruel stooge of a cruel stooge of imperialism, President Daoud Khan, which the force of revolutionary comrades of the Afghan army, the peasants, small size of workers, and oppressed people tried to emancipate their their selves from the chains of land owners, from the cruelty of religious and tribal leaders, and from the rotten traditions and brutal cust customs inherited for uh, centuries. But America with her allies, especially Saudi Wahhabis, Pakistani generals, Chinese chauvinistic reaction reactionaries to uh, Russian uh, allies and Irani mullahs with their indigenous proxies uh, dipped the revolution in blood many months before the Russian invasion in December 1979 into Afghanistan. America started, started a covert operation with the name of Operation Cyclone with the help of Saudi and Pakistani ruling class. They created an alternate black economy depending on drugs like opium and the refined, refined form of its heroin to take the war hybrid on the cost of ruining the lives of millions of people addicted to this curse. And at the same time, strengthening religious fundamentalism in the region, this nexus destroyed the whole fabrics of the Oriental society in Afghanistan and neighboring countries. Russian invasion and exit both posed a great danger to Afghan revolution. First, Soviet invasion provided a pretext to America and uh, allies to launch full-scale war against revolution. And second, the Soviet untimely exit made a ground for imperialism to take control of the country to reach Central Asian states markets as well as to exploit the mineral resources of Afghanistan and of the Central Asia. Comrade Ted Grant uh, predicted in his uh, uh, then article that ultimately that uh, untimely exit of uh, Soviet forces will provide a space for imperialism and his creature fundamentalism to wage a war and kill every single educated and enlightened person in the same process, and the same process uh, is going on till date. History doesn't repeat itself, but on, uh, but, uh, on a higher stage. Uh, same repetition is taking place uh, time and again in Afghanistan since 1992. American imperialism installed the dollar mujahideen, our so-called freedom fighters in Kabul after the collapse of Afghan democratic regime. Dollar Mujahideen tried their best with the sophisticated weapons to topple the Afghan regime, but they failed with a lot of uh, casualties and uh, defeats on all fronts. Afghanistan, Afghan democratic uh, government only collapsed when, then when the Russian president Boris Yeltsin uh, stopped economic help of the government. When Mujahideen came to power, they were inherently incapable of building any state or its institution, provide education or health facilities to the people. Instead, they fell in a chaotic small states of various law wards. Then the, you know, call the, the 10th largest company of oil and gas of Texas, America, forwarded a project of a new fundamental Taliban against uh, with the help of Saudis and uh, uh, Pakistan to reach to the oil and gas reserve, reserves of the Central Asian state Turkmenistan. Unocol established a consortium consists of uh, Delta Oil Company of the then Saudi King Abdullah and uh, uh, Turkmen Gazprom of Turkmenistan the project was uh, uh, sabotaged by the competing company, Bridos, by supporting the Taliban enemies, the Northern Alliance. With addition to the conflict, 
the inherent split of Taliban and factional fly, uh, fly, uh, fights uh, from the uh, first day. As the Kabul was captured in 1996 by Taliban. Same incidents are happening again among the uh, various fractions of Taliban fighter in aggravated form after 25 years now. In 2001, America again toppled Taliban government in an assault on Afghanistan with the installation of X dollar Mujahideen on the Kabul throne with some cosmetic changes of dresses of the rulers and modern touches and uh, attributed Afghan fictitious nationalism to the old fundamentalist beasts. They raised the slogan of uh, uh, gender equality and women rights, which was confined to a couple of big cities, while the great majority of women lived in the Stone Age, while WikiLeaks, uh, the, the, the WikiLeaks exposed uh, that the uh, feminism was introduced by uh, uh, American to attract the European Union interest and uh, favor. American pawn President Ashraf Ghani once wrote in, the, in his article, soon after the evacuation of the Soviet army in 1989, the collapse of the Afghan puppet government the Afghan Democratic Republican government, he meant, is the matter of days. While the Afghan revolutionary government sustained for more than three years, he was unaware that he, the little clown, was forecasting his own disgraceful future and fate ruined in the hands of brutal laws of history when a coward Tomek cancer patient stole $169 million of pupils' money, fled without fighting to UAE, leaving behind a strong 300,000 army with the $80 billion of ammunition and logistics make down the heads of the millions of pupils in shame, many of whom, including some diplomats and army generals, expressed uh, their uh, feelings in articles and tweets. One can imagine the soul of the uh, American imperialism in the yesterday ceremony of 9-11. After two decades of war on terror and punishing the fake responsible of the incident, while the real culprits, the Saudis, Al-Qaeda, and uh, Al Nusra Front, etc., are still Americans' friend for repressing the oppressed and revolutionary movements in the Muslim world. Uh, today's Afghanistan is once again under the rule under the rule of barbarism of Taliban militants. The state is collapsed. Its state and social institutions are vanished. Newly government is facing a great deflation due to stoppage of the cycle of currency and closed banks. Some international monitoring institutions have analyzed that in coming weeks, 97% of the population will fall under the poverty line in Afghanistan. While at the other hand, Taliban militants have no program for any betterment of the society, economy, healthcare, or education. They do not have skilled experts to build the state and social institutions Neither they have any kind of expertise to reduce the pain and curse of the pupil. Taliban militants have almost controlled the whole country, eradicating the threats of disintegration of the ancient country. The plan of Rashid Dostam and Turkish President Tayyab Urdogan once had is evaporate in the air. Taliban are not uh, in uh, unity but uh, distributed uh, interna internally in various uh, fractions. And they are split into main fractions according uh, with uh, coordinating with Qatar serving the West, while the other one is uh, subjugated to Pakistan, which is anticipating Chinese and Russian help in solving their problems. The positive aspect of the phenomenon is uh, uh, defines 
of the women and youth whose slogans will echo in the society and will become a stronger voice which will have the power to attract the vast layers of the people to liberate them from such barbarism. Thank you, comrade. Thank you very much, comrade. Uh, a really enlightening introduction. Um, comrade um, Farouk, are you here? Farouk Suleria. Yes. yes. You. You're next. Thank you, comrade. Thank you very much. Uh, comrades, I will uh, briefly speak about uh, uh, five points. Um, one, there has been this debate about uh, why this, uh, you know, the so-called Afghan government collapsed so quickly along with its military apparatus. Um, I will speak about uh, the position of some of the anti-imperialists who are celebrating the Taliban victory, uh, how we as left in Pakistan and Afghanistan, even India, we have viewed it. Uh, then very related to it, the orientalistic kind of uh, discourses starting with uh, President Biden uh, and onwards in the Western media. I will mainly speak about the resistance that has come up in inside Afghanistan and internationally uh, in the Afghan diaspora. And finally, what kind of demands we should be raising uh, as, as, as the left and uh, what should we be doing? Okay, first of all, uh, the collapse. Uh, I will very briefly speak about it because this is a whole debate. I have written an article two years ago um, where my perspective goes a bit wrong, but uh, the analysis about occupation remains very valid. The thing is the whole political and military structure that was built after 9-11 in Afghanistan, it was aimed at sustaining the occupation. It was not aimed at uh, building the state there. It was not aimed at empowering the civil society there. Uh, and, you know, all the talk about women rights and all that, the justifications that were offered at the time. For instance, uh, 69,000 Afghan soldiers have been killed in this war last 20 years. Uh, and when we say that uh, the, the army just collapsed, we are actually in a way behaving in a very imperialist and orientalistic manner as well. The thing is, these soldiers were used as guinea pigs by the, by the NATO forces, uh, by the US forces. <clears throat> so uh, that's what we need to understand. Secondly, they turned Afghanistan into a neoliberal laboratory. And I mean literally neoliberal laboratory. The whole aid, the whole process of rebuilding, so-called rebuilding of Afghanistan was, uh, you know, handed down to the NGOs. The idea was, and there are documents, uh, the idea was that NGOs will do the development because the states in third world are corrupt. What happened by 2010, 2011, some of the big NGOs, international NGOs involved in the so-called rebuilding, they held a public press conference in Kabul and they pointed out, look, the NGOs have been more corrupt than the state, any state in the world. And Afghanistan was declared the second most corrupt country by Transparency International, not to state that Transparency is any good institution, but just uh, as an indication. So from 2011, 12 onwards, more money was funneled into, into the state apparatuses. In short, what I'm trying to say is that the whole military political setup that was uh, put in place, it was aimed at sustaining the occupation. So the moment the occupation ends, the military and political facade created by the US occupation also collapsed. That's my understanding, that's my analysis of the situation. Uh, secondly, very briefly, uh, some of the uh, left-wing people and scholars of the post-colonial uh, so-called post-colonial uh, leaning, uh, they have been celebrative of the Taliban victory. We in, in Pakistan, uh, in India, I'm talking about the major mainstream parties in India, uh, as well as uh, some of the left groups in uh, Afghanistan that I know of, including Rawa, Hambastagi, which is Solidarity, a uh, couple of more left groups, which are basically splits from Hambastagi and old uh, 
uh, ELO, we have we have been saying the following: that this is a defeat of the Afghan people, the working classes, the women there. There is nothing to celebrate. One barbarism has been defeated. We welcome that, but we do not celebrate the little barbarism because that is perhaps even more dangerous for the for the region that is there. So we we do not own this victory as a sort of uh, uh, victory one could associate with uh, in in Cuba, in Vietnam, in other certain cases where imperialism was defeated. Um, another discourse that has emerged is uh, very orientalistic in the Western media, in Pakistani media. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, Iran uh, and some other countries of the region, but definitely Western media. Some of them uh, I've been pointing out on my Facebook wall. Uh, but for instance, let's start with the US president, Joe Biden. What he's saying, look, Afghans for the last 100 years, they have been fighting each other. There has never been a central government. There has never been democracy. You know, all kind of nonsense you can point out about Afghanistan is pointing out. Why? Because the, you are blaming the Afghan people. Look, we went there to modernize them. We wanted to bring enlightenment there and development, but they are Oriental people. They want to live with their, with their religion. It's in their culture, it's in their religion. Fact of the matter is, Afghanistan, as Comrade Hamid was pointing out, uh, the last time we had a, a, a revolution that declared itself Marxist revolution was in Afghanistan. This was the last Marxist revolution. Okay, I will, and many of us in Pakistan, Afghanistan, we keep disagreeing with each other whether it was a revolutionary coup or a revolution, but that's a separate debate. I'm not going into that. What I'm pointing out is that this terrible destruction of the Afghan history is very orientalistic. It is aimed at, you know, blaming Afghan people for the imperialist defeat. We should be aware of it. Hence, both this anti-imperialist, so-called anti-imperialist position of uh, celebrating Taliban and this Orientalism, they are very dangerous. We should oppose it. And I'll come to that in a while. What I really want to focus today is the resistance. It was within 24 hours, within 24 hour, hours of the uh, Taliban occupation of Kabul, five brave girls in their mid twenties, almost all of them university students, they held a demonstration outside of the presidential palace in Kabul. You might have seen a video, many in Pakistan, uh, and perhaps some in Kabul and elsewhere, they pointed out, look, this is all a conspiracy. Taliban just uh, uh, sort of uh, staged this demo to have uh, a more, uh, uh, you know, uh, humanistic face for themselves. I just happened to know one of the girls, the key, key organizer, Sudaba. I've done an interview with her, which was banned by Facebook. From, my, from many websites. Uh, perhaps it is still available on the website of uh, Green Left Weekly, Australia. Then we had Yom Taklal. On 15th, they occupy uh, Kabul and uh, by and large the entire Afghanistan. 19th happened to be the National Day of Afghanistan. Uh, a national day they have been celebrating since uh, 1920. 1920. Uh, as, as a celebration of national liberation from British colonialism. Only a uh, few years in the 1990s when uh, uh, Taliban were in power, this day was not celebrated, but it has been celebrated by the communists, by Dawood, by Zahid Shah and all the previous governments, starting with Amanullah Khan, who was a progressive king. Uh, on that day, uh, there were demonstrations in many cities and hugely repressive uh, uh, measures by, by the Taliban. Three youth were killed in, in Jalalabad. 16, the reports are unverified, but you know, if we go by the 
uh, Twitter accounts and so on from Afghanistan. 16 were killed in Asadabad. And these youth were protesting against the Taliban action of uh, uh, banning the traditional Afghan flag. Actually, it's not really traditional, but okay. Uh, and more importantly, more importantly, last week, uh, and that day you had a demonstration in Kabul as well, where you had seven girls participating and one of them, uh, she, Crystal, she, she had a video interview posted by New York Times and it went viral. But most importantly, last week, Monday evening, perhaps hundreds or maybe thousands of young people, they came out in the middle of the night rather, so that it's a uh, rather question of security, they are not identified. They started chanting uh, against Taliban and also the, the slow, uh, you know, Allah Akbar, God is great, which was actually a resistance uh, slogan before Taliban took over across Afghanistan. Uh, ever since every day in dozens of cities across Afghanistan, there have been women coming out protesting against Taliban. I mean, what was started by these five girls on 17th of August has now spread across, uh, across Afghanistan. You might have seen some of the video footages. One of our comrades, Imran, he rightly pointed out on his Facebook that the most brave, the most courageous chapter of women's struggle is being written in Afghanistan right now. And you know, what is so, so impressive about their struggle that they have forced the Taliban, they have forced the Taliban for first time in their history that they are staging women rallies now. You might have seen it was reported on Swedish TV as well yesterday as well. I think it, it, it went uh, global news. Um, they organized uh, a meeting of uh, so-called women uh, in very strange kind of burqas in a in University of Education uh, uh, meeting hall, and then a rally of women clad in burqa. Uh, many say that from Afghanistan, that many uh, inside burqa were actually Taliban men. And uh, in other case, uh, the, the, the women were forced to wear this burqa and attend this conference. What I'm pointing out is that initially they were uh, trying to scare away the women who were protesting. There was propaganda against them that they are small, tiny groups of westernized women. But, you know, uh, they, they, they are so scared now that they have to stage counter rallies because they know these this small groups, these small groups of women, they are representative of the larger hatred of the Taliban. And over and over again, over and over again, uh, there have been studies in, in, uh, in Afghanistan. I just quote one by the Asia Foundation. Uh, it pointed out, it was conducted for many years on annual basis. During the Doha, Doha deal, when it was going on, the negotiations were going on, 90%, to be exact, 88% of the Afghan people, they wanted the women rights defended in the Doha deal. And I have never seen, I haven't been to many countries, but every time I speak about Afghanistan, I point out that I have not seen the thirst for education anywhere as high as in Afghanistan, but particularly among the Afghan women, small girls up to grown up women. My own mother-in-law, she was about 60 when she started doing her education. She learned Persian, she's Pashtun. She did some schooling, now she can read and write. Uh, at Kabul University, the, before the Taliban, for the last about 20 years, since there are not so many facilities, the lectures start at five in the morning and they go on till 10 in the evening, nonstop, because there are 80 to 90,000 students registered there of all ages. And over a period of time, because I've been monitoring this university and going there, I love the campus and for many reasons I've been going there. Slowly, the number of women 
uh, was more than the men actually uh, in many, many faculties. So this, this resistance is something we need to count on and we need to help build. So lastly, very briefly, what should we do? And to go plan and what is to be done? I think the most important thing right now is to build a global solidarity with the Afghan people. The kind of solidarity we witnessed before the Iraq war, when we had history's biggest demonstrations, although we couldn't stop the war, but definitely it set up a very good example. We need that kind of solidarity with the people of Afghanistan. Secondly, we should not recognize the Taliban government, but we should ask for the help of the Afghan people. There is a humanitarian crisis. I'll speak more when there is a Q&A session uh, and you know, about this demand because it triggers a lot of debate. However, what should not trigger any debate is the fact that we should do everything possible for the Afghan refugees. I am really thankful and let me flag the, the excellent work done by Comrade Hamid himself because uh, 80 to uh, 180 people from Afghanistan, children, women, old, young, uh, they came to Quetta where he lives and Afghan people are not uh, legal anymore in Pakistan if they enter Pakistan. And uh, Comrade Hamid was really generous. Some more uh, friends there who really risked their jobs and many other things to help these Afghan refugees. Some of them comrades, including my own brother-in-law and definitely uh, some more comrades involved. Uh, I, I don't want to go into details for many reasons. That should be the key focus now of our struggle, rescuing the lives of our comrades and Afghan activists, even when we do not agree with them, helping Afghan refugees. We need solidarity work at so many levels. This is just one, but especially in Pakistan. Uh, unfortunately, for the dirty propaganda of the state from both sides, actually, last 20 years, there has been a widespread hatred of the Afghan people in Afghanistan. And Pakistan is, of course, the most hated country in Afghanistan. Uh, this is a huge challenge for socialists in both countries and internationally as well. Uh, also, we need to think about some of the uh, new initiatives uh, that I can discuss later on to save time. Uh, one initiative, uh, my wife, who is from Afghanistan, um, she and some of our friends we are trying to take is start a blog in English, as Comrade Amit was pointing out as well. For whatever reasons, English and French and Spanish and Arabic, they are big and important languages. Um, so. We need many such initiatives and also uh, meetings like this where we can come together and uh, discuss and uh, sort of present some, some forward uh, moves uh, so that we can build this solidarity which is badly needed. Thank you very much, comrades. Oh, thank you very much, Farooq. That's really given us a fascinating and unique insight into the situation. Uh, we'll move straight on and ask Comrade Aman if you're ready to uh, make your contribution now, please. Sure, thank you. Um, I, I think uh, it, the two talks actually gave a, a very thorough view with regard to what is happening within Afghanistan. And let me just echo that. Um, the uh, protests which have been taking place in Afghanistan uh, have been quite a few. They have been going on non-stop effectively. Uh, whether it was the case that they had it at night times or whether it was the case of the day before yesterday where they actually marched through Kabul uh, and the protests that were taking place. Um, and also similarly, um, there are millions of Afghans outside Afghanistan. Uh, and the very, very first day we had protests taking place of Afghan people uh, in a variety of cities in Iran. And they were also uh, effectively echoing what was said earlier, that, that there is uh, no acceptance for Taliban. I think among the, uh, those parties within Afghanistan, uh, from the ones that I met, uh, who actually were thinking that Taliban were the um, sort of savior, uh, these were only, from what I have understood, uh, a group of Maoists and a couple of splinters from them uh, across the society. And I think, across most of the people 
in Afghanistan, uh, the protests against uh, Taliban or initiations of Taliban has been going on from start. In fact, the number of uh, people who have been uh, held in Afghanistan and were chased by Taliban door to door um, are so many. And uh, one of the first things that they did was any finding of any person uh, who was considered to be uh, from the left or activists from that point of view, door-to-door uh, -door searches have been going on, especially around Kabul. Uh, the, there is one thing which I thought probably is worth mentioning. Uh, I, I think that there, there is major difference, uh, and I'm sure this has been discussed before. Uh, there's a major difference between what happened, for example, with regard to the time that the uh, US actually did lose a military war. In Afghanistan, it wasn't a military war. And I think the idea that uh, US and NATO and allied forces were there in order to ensure that there would be state built there. Uh, everybody knew that is not the case. There was a puppet state uh, and the whole idea of that state was one thing and that was to ensure the continuity of occupation and obviously the corruption which was going on in non-stop uh, among all of the strata of the ruling parties, um, whether in the state or outside it. There is one thing, and I think that that is the big thing, and that is if you go back, uh, the actual initial idea of withdrawal from Afghanistan did not come at Biden time, but it came at Trump's time. And there were initial talks prior to that, uh, from the time that even Omar was taken into Pakistan. The main issue, uh, I think, which is probably of concern, in addition to the points that were said, I'm not talking in contradiction, but rather than actually adding the points further, the questions that are raised is this. Uh, the whole idea of US could be probably summed up in one way, and that is the actual uh, competition with China and the move into Far East uh, is number one for US at the moment. That's on one hand. On the second hand, uh, Afghanistan is on the route of the Chinese Silk Road, and especially with the relation with Pakistan, Afghanistan is crucial to Chinese uh, from the point of view of trade uh, from the north or even towards Iran. Uh, therefore, one of the issues was this, in terms of China's approach, the intention was one thing, and that is whatever happens internally is internal business. What we want to ensure is continuity and the continuity they were after uh, was effectively sought through both the state of Ashraf Ghani and that of the Taliban, which is very similar to what Iran did in it to a large extent. I think the issue is this, that the US was happy to, uh, and NATO were happy to leave Afghanistan, provided what they consider to be as terrorists stays within Afghanistan. If that stays there, they have no issue with it. There was no problem. So the issue of democracy, rights, etc., was never an issue. Uh, the main question was, that should US actually leave, could they actually put an alternative acceptable to the variety of factions of bourgeoisie within Afghanistan? The idea was that Taliban was supposed to be one of those forces. What happened was the Taliban saw the vacuum and decided to go ahead faster than the others. That's what really happened in terms of the Taliban getting the power. There was no talk about the Taliban not sharing, for example, with even Ashraf Ghani and the rest. The question was, Taliban should not be on his own, and effectively Taliban sought that. And that was the big surprise uh, of the expectation. So the fall is not the case I didn't expect it. Um, UK has publicly has said it, US has said it, they were expecting time before the collapse. Uh, so the question is the speed. Uh, it wasn't the case that that was not on the agenda. Uh, the other issue which I think is also uh, hugely important uh, is that to recognize the fact that the US has actually, and NATO has agreed that uh, it doesn't matter how reactionary the power, the ruling power is in Afghanistan, provided they stay within Afghanistan and do not decide to actually um, export or uh, terror outside Afghanistan is acceptable, is a big issue. That issue is not limited to Afghanistan. That issue is also related to other countries in the region, namely Iraq. The idea of the Baghdad talk is a continuation of that. Could they actually have a grouping, a grouping literally of different factions that could come to take the state, provided they actually manage to 
all the area. So there are repercussions. What I'm trying to say is the issue of Afghanistan is not an Afghan issue. The issue is much more international. Shape of the region, acceptability, the vacuum that would be in other places with the departure of US, the role that EU considers that it could play, and already we're seeing France doing this in Baghdad and similarly in Lebanon. Thirdly, the fact that this opening is there, it means a variety of reactionary forces see openings. And these openings means they have more power, more ability to actually carry out uh, the uh, backlash against uh, the struggles which are taking place. And that is taking place across the region uh, from Tunisia, Lebanon, right across Iran and uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. So it is, the question is this, the shape is changing. I think if you had the new world order making a change once, now we're seeing a different change. The acceptability of variety of reactionary forces in power and the extent that they can actually work together and stay in power. And as I said, similar situation is happening in Iraq. Afghanistan surprise was really the speed that uh, this force did not accept it. And similar thing could happen in Baghdad uh, if the one of the reactionary um, Daeshi forces or similar of the Iran supported uh, groups decide to actually take the power in advance and not wait for the others and not to accept companies uh, and coordination with the others. That is the issue which is I think partly being taken into account. So the question is a wider one. The other issue from the point of view of the recognition of this should be understood from the other side. It is not just the US and NATO that makes the decision. What has happened is the changes. Over the past 20 years, at the same time since 1911, we've seen major changes in terms of growth of population, changes in the working class, a reasonable degree of change within the bourgeoisie in variety of countries in the region. And also in Afghanistan, for, speci for specifically, as we're talking about that, in the past 20 years, we've had at least, or we could think about one generation that has not seen Taliban. One generation that did not see the rule of the Taliban. And this generation is not easily possible to put back into the position that they are there, even compared to the generation before that had seen Taliban. It is this new generation. And that's why we see huge amount of young people in there. I think the idea that was mentioned absolutely is not holding any water that as if women's rights were introduced by US, it isn't the case. This new generation, including women, and at the forefront at the moment, there are women and the protests are taking place everywhere. Uh, they are actually making or showing a change which was not there 20 odd years ago. And it is not because of the US uh, occupation or NATO's occupation. This is because this generation has not only not seen Taliban, but because it has seen change and the world has changed over the past 20 years, especially with internet and everything else. Um, by the way, Afghanistan is one of the major um, news media places in the whole region in terms of the number of TVs, number of reporting, et cetera, which are taking place in Afghanistan. Train journalists uh, are one of the known ones in the whole region. So it's not just effectively people living in villages, uh, we're having a capitalist system, but huge amount of tribalism in the area as well. Uh, in this current scenario, we can see that other countries in the region, whether Iran, Pakistan, and uh, all of the others, uh, including Saudi Arabia and the rest, they are trying to actually make a show of this in order to actually increase their influence, not just because they're thinking about influence in Afghanistan, because, but because this is being considered to be a test case for other countries in the region as well. So we have got now a lot of uh, competition, if you like, uh, sometimes a little bit harsher than competition uh, in terms of showing force. At the moment, a large amount of the US left tanks that were in Afghanistan have been transferred across the border to Iran. Islamic Republic has got quite a few of them in Iran. Uh, and the, the show of uh, the convoys that were passed over, uh, including the airplanes and tanks, were huge. Uh, and also we have got uh, Saudis and uh, Turkey, as was mentioned, trying to actually make some position there. Turkey was uh, the first one who had said, if the 
new government is going to be formed, they were going to guarantee the airport and they were hoping on the role that they have with the tribes uh, that had previous connections to Turkey. Uh, that did not materialize. So at the moment, we also had a scenario that soon as uh, Pakistan uh, tried to actually use force to help Taliban in the north in Panjshir, uh, immediately we had the response from others, uh, from Qatar and Saudis, and also from the Iran of saying that Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan is trying to actually play dirty and is trying to actually intervene and get, if it can, some sort of a higher influence prior to anything else. Overall, the scenario is something which is, I think, very vibrant. At, on one hand, we have the struggle that is taking place in Afghanistan. Uh, two, Taliban, as correctly said, Taliban, Talib means a person who studies in a school or studying Islamic learning. That's called a Talib. Taliban means a grouping of them. Uh, so as a result, what we have with Taliban is not one unit, it's a huge amount of fraction. It's not one organization that decides. It's a huge number uh, of different sections uh, from extreme ones, even Daesh, right down to the other soft level. I think the general media presence is trying to show that as if Taliban has changed, we can accept the new Taliban. The difference between the new Taliban and the old Taliban is that the new Taliban does not decide to blow up uh, Twin Towers, but the old Taliban did. That's the picture which is being framed. And the idea of accepting Taliban as the uh, representatives of the masses in Afghanistan is something that everybody in Afghanistan and everybody in the region, I think across the world, knows that is not correct. So not recognizing Afghanistan as a state, uh, Taliban as a state, I think that's one issue. Recognition of the refugees right now, um, in one hand, US has transferred some of the Afghans across to Africa. Germany has said we've been very kind. U UK brought some and effectively we had even one person who brought 200 dogs uh, across and not even people. Norway took one plane and only had one person in it. Uh, Pakistan, to some extent, closed the border for some part. Iran closed this border. There was a lot of pressure. It opened the border. There's something like seven to 800 Afghans traveling across towards Iran. Uh, the important point of recognition of them and acceptance of refugees, I think is important. In Iran, we have now a general comment which is going across the social media and otherwise that everybody says anybody who comes from Afghanistan are welcome here. So therefore the whole idea is to allow the, or the notion of Afghans are welcome is not just uh, across Europe and other countries, but within the region as well. And the working that is being done with refugees or people who are moving from Afghanistan, I think of, is of huge importance. Uh, last but not least, uh, I think showing the fact that this change is something that we have to be aware of and we have to recognize. And I think it is an international change. Uh, the idea of an international change or a change of mood of what can or cannot happen means that currently every country does not need to get acceptance of US as it was the case before. Any reactionary force does have a chance to come to power unless right from the working class within the countries, in each one of them, the pressure against uh, the rule of bourgeoisie continues. And that is the big thing. And I think there are good signs and bad signs. We can't just see everything as doom and gloom. There is also a lot of protests and a lot of open arms, I think across the region and a lot of solidarity deep down rather than between the states. And those are the main issues. What can be done? I think I quite agree. Recognition of Taliban should not be on the agenda. Ensuring that the idea of uh, if the US military rule is not there, people cannot govern, so therefore they have to be there. The idea that uh, everywhere the US role, which is diminished today in terms of military work, at least in the all of the Middle East and in Afghanistan was a clear start of it. This is going to be a, a new issue. Vacuums are going to be created. China, Europe, etc., would try to get in. But our effective emphasis is on building the struggle, 
ensuring that the solidarity from the bottom up is actually there and ensuring that we would be able uh, to actually extend this uh, by not only welcoming refugees, but by showing the solidarity in terms of action against every single bourgeoisie that we have in our own countries. Uh, and let me stop there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Comrade Aman. Um, of course, the three contributions have given us really a unique insight into the situation. And I'm really, uh, I feel it a privilege to be able to, uh, to hear them. I know that this will have raised uh, a number of questions and points of discussion and maybe of controversy. And uh, I um, obviously we're expecting a lively discussion now, but before the discussion takes place, I'd like to say one thing. Um, it's, it's a source also a great pride to see how many comrades are here from maybe a dozen countries including uh, many comrades from, uh, from the region, especially from Pakistan. And I'd like to say that, um, you know, there are comrades here who we haven't seen for a long time. And there are also many comrades here that we haven't seen before at our meetings. You will not find anywhere else a forum, a genuine international forum, like that we've been able to, um, to uh, offer through uh, WIN. Um, please, take advantage of the opportunities that this offer offers. If you're not on our mailing list, please um, give me give us your uh, email addresses. You can put it in the chat. If you like, you can just um, send it to me privately and I'll put it on the um, on our weekly um, mailing list. We have weekly meetings. We've had the privilege like we have here today um, many, many times so in relation to countries around the world. Um, real eyewitness on the spot record reports from comrades who are active in the working class struggle and the working workers movement so um this is uh, i think a precious facility and a precious asset which i hope we can all make the maximum uh, use of now um we'll take questions and uh, discussion um i think what we'll do is if you have a question unless it's a very short simple question which re requires a direct answer um i'll ask the comrade the speaker comrades not to reply to them now uh but to wait till the end when they'll have a chance to sum up uh, the discussion so questions and discussion uh, uh the forum is open to you now please comrades silvana silvana from uh, from uh, brazil hi um I'm sorry that I haven't been present for the last few uh, weeks. Um, I really are, I am concerned about women's situation in uh, uh, Afghanistan. I didn't really understand the difference between the Taliban now and the Taliban from 20 years ago, if he, he could explain a little bit better. And I saw like the women that were uh, in the manifestation last uh, three days ago, they were whipped by the Taliban. So I really hope that women can um, be the front of this new revolution in Afghanistan. Thank you. Uh, Matt. Hi, comrades. Thanks. Uh, very useful contributions. Um, it's uh, you know, one of these great. Uh, positions which you, you know, clearly, is, as, as uh, Roger has said, you know, we, we get to speak to people who who actually participate in 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 sight, which is not something we we fr frequently get the chance, particularly Marxists. I mean, we can speak to. Obviously, we have. I mean, I'm from Scotland. We have Afghan refugees, but we have a shortage of Marxist Africa, Afghans uh, or Marxist um, Marxists in the region. So it's very precious to us. I think. I mean, the thing, the one thing you can you can see here is is fear from the ruling class, and you can feel it. I mean, even in here in the imperialist countries, you can feel the fear of of of, of the work of the ruling class as as that system it is it is built and, and operated over the over the, the past decades, and particularly since the Second World War, is now in key in decay, um, and clearly they are losing control. The point of they are losing control of sections of the world. I mean, you know, having having walked in and then and then and then having to flee out of them 
it, 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 it actually reduces them to, to really very, um, to a very uh, problematic uh, point. Uh, and, and we can clearly see, clearly see this also in the course of their defense of uh, uh, countries like Israel, which they see as being their bulwarks in the, in, in, in the Middle East and so on. You know, that, 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 uh, you know, uh, and, and this is why also they're, they're, they will act against the left, both, both here and, and, and of course elsewhere. Uh, and they are doing so. Um, I think there's a, there's a there's a few questions. I mean, first of all, I think that obviously you've got uh, what is clearly a developing crisis. I mean, I, I, I think from the, from what comrades have said and what's what's been reported is that the Taliban regime is not solid and is not not in a position to establish itself. It does not have popular support, or it, or, or it's a, it has a popular opposition in, in much of the country. Um, it it is facing a position in which. You know, clearly the, the currency is about to collapse or will collapse. Um, people will go short of food. Um, you know, the basic, the basic questions are going to be asked in, in, in Afghanistan and the Taliban have no answers. Um, and so I don't, I don't see it as being a stable, stable regime in, in the slightest. And once again, the question is then asked, you know, okay, what, what forces are, 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 are able to, to, to raise you know, serious points in terms of, you know, how the society should be run and so on. So, so it's really also a question to come in terms of the state of the, you know, the organised working class and what is it like in terms of, you know, you, you said, you know, there's been development of the working class, which is what, what we'd expect in the last 20 years. But, I mean, is it, is it organised? Is it, you know, the, are, there, are there groups and so on and so forth? The other question, I think, is is about the, 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 the Chinese um, intervention, because clearly the Chinese um, you know, see the opportunity of, of the retreat of the Americans and the fact that obviously they already have a, a you know, strategic um, uh, deal with the Pakistanis and, uh, in terms of taking over um, uh, at least one port and that they would wish, wish to incorporate sections of Afghanistan into their into what into what they're doing regionally and and, and more, more more strategically and the question is then okay what is the program of the chinese um state and bureaucracy in afghanistan and how does that how does that sit with um you know the, the, the current state uh and how will that impact you know any you know regionally and 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 in terms of the the the, 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 the working class and, and the broader population you know, uh, well, obviously, it's 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 a difficult position for the for the for the Chinese bureaucracy to be in as well. I mean, they they, they don't, don't want to deal with, you know, they've, they've done a deal, um, but but obviously it's like a very unstable one. And I can quite you know, quite see that, that, that you know, I mean, I, I know there's been resistance in Pakistan to 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 the Chinese uh, efforts, but um, it would just be interesting to see what what comrades think in terms of because that that's the one, if you like, the one force um, you know that, 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 that can intervene. You know, in terms of, of regionally, has the facility to do so and the base to do so, um, and therefore could actually make a difference. Um, you know, particularly under conditions, as I say, in terms of a um, a growth crisis. And you know, this is not not a not a stable situation at all. Thanks. Right. Thank you, uh, Matt. Uh, next, we'll have um, Steve Zeltzer from USA, followed by Sarah Rapala from Sri Lanka, followed by John Ryman, also from the USA. Thank you. Well, I, I, I think it Thank is a, a defeat, obviously, for US imperialism. And uh, the United States, uh, you know, has been weakened uh, tremendously as a result of this. And the question uh, for the working class is, uh, what, what, what were the causes of this? And, and how can the working class of the United States uh, fight against uh, imp U.S. imperialist uh, interventions and expand uh, uh, the support of workers around the world. I think that the, um, unfortunately, the left in the United States and has been completely silent uh, other than uh, having articles about the need to uh, fight uh, for the shutdown of all U.S. military bases, 800 bases around the world and withdrawal of U.S. troops around the world. And I think that that is, I, need, I think we need an a international, united international campaign uh, to shut down the US imperialism, uh, to expand this. And uh, the role of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party is that they wanna keep their forces around the world. They have this over the horizon, 
which means they will continue to bomb using drones and other forces uh, in, in the Middle East. So I think we have to need an international campaign. I agree that we need to unite with the Afghani workers, the women who are fighting this oppression. And I think there are large numbers of Afghanis who are probably angry and disgusted by US imperialism, leaving them in the lurch. So I think that there's a basis of working with uh, Afghani militants who want to struggle for a, uh, a different society in Afghanistan and, and against the, uh, the Taliban and other reactionary uh, forces. And the other, the other question is China, because this is a victory in a way, in my view, uh, of China and, and uh, Russia uh, and their ability to make deals. And they will support the Taliban government, the Chinese. Uh, as they've supported other reactionary governments around the world. So I think that uh, we need to have a perspective towards uh, the defense of the Afghani uh, people, workers, and also uh, against the support that they will get from China, because I think China wants to fill the role in a different way, though, the, of the United States uh, in Afghanistan. And, and of course, the struggle for the resources, the natural resources of Afghanistan, which China is, is interested in getting. So. I think those are some important questions. We had a rally uh, in San Francisco, um, which is, I understand, the only rally in the United States calling for the withdrawal of all US troops. But I think politically in the United States and in the unions, the fight against uh, war, imperialist war, the fight against uh, uh, US military uh, intervention around the world, is, is there's an opportunity now. And workers are asking, what happened? Why did this happen? Why did it go on for 21 years? Uh, and why is it continuing to go on? So I think that's a political task. And I would like to see international action globally uh, against uh, US bases around the world and withdrawal of US troops. I think that's important internationally for the working class. Thank you, comrades. Thank you, Steve. Um, Sir Andapala from Sri Lanka. So comrade, I wanted to get clarifications. I think comrade Matt and uh, Steve uh, gave some uh, 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 clarifications. China because uh, suddenly after the withdraw the U.S. forward and uh, offer the support and what it colors uh, you know uh, the, the, I like to uh, get some understand uh, the, the, the Chinese role within the Afghan uh, uh, you know Afghan conflict so uh, can you explain one of uh, uh, comrade uh, on this that. Um. Thank you. Um, yeah, John this Ryman. is my question. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yep, thank you. Uh, John Ryman, USA. Thank you. So, first of all, I'm just on a side comment. I'd like to comment on what Farouk Suleria said about some left um, in, in the US and Europe giving uh, some sort of support to the Taliban. And it's an example of the absolutely disastrous state of the left. Because, I mean, this is part and parcel of the widespread, far wider spread support for Assad in Syria. And also, um, for instance, uh, you have Code Pink, which is the largest so-called peace group here in the United States, which supports the Iranian dictatorship. So it really shows the disastrous state of the left. Um, the main thing I wanted to comment, I've been reading everything I could about, uh, about Afghanistan, and I came across this book by this guy, Anand Gopal. And what he did back um, in the years between about 2002 and 2010, he just spent years in Afghanistan, traveling mainly to the rural areas, but throughout Afghanistan and just spending his time talking with all kinds of different people from so-called warlords, which he says in Afghanistan are really, uh, uh, they call them commanders, military commanders, to, ho to housewives and, and so on. And he explained, it, his book, I mean, it's such a stunning proof of the theory of permanent revolution that, uh, I mean, I'm sure he didn't set out for it to be that, but it, it is. And he, he explains why no uh, strong central state was able to develop in, in Afghanistan. Also, incidentally, it um, it's really confirms the theories of Engels and the origin of the family. 
that was the ownership of pro the private development of private property that was the basis for oppression of women. And that's certainly, I think, the case in Afghanistan. Um, and my God, the capitalist class that he describes as having developed there. Oh, well, first of all, uh, he, you know, Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution explains that no capitalist class in the former colonial world can develop independent of imperial powers. And he explains, he very clearly shows how the Taliban are not a truly nationalist force, that they're reliant on the one hand on, uh, on uh, um, Pakistani capitalism, in particular the ISI, and on the other hand, on a layer of the Arab bourgeoisie. But the other wing of the capitalist class that de developed really linked with US imperialism, it's just a giant uh, uh, group of, uh, of uh, protection racketeers. And just, I wanna just read one quote. He, he, uh, uh, he met, met, met with this guy, Zamani, who was one, one of the, uh, he was linked with, uh, uh, with uh, the US military, supposedly providing them information and so on. And here's quoting Zamani. He, Zamani says, this whole land is filled with thieves and liars. This is what you Americans have made. I know this game, I know how to survive. I went to the Americans and said, I can find bin Laden. I told them, give me $5 million and I'll bring you his head. So they went and talked to their bosses and arranged it, and, and I got $5 million from them. Then a few, then I went to Al-Qaeda, and I told them, give me $1 million, or I'll turn you over to the Americans. So they gave me, this was, if you remember, there was a battle of Tora Bora, where the U.S. was uh, um, attacking bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, I don't know, maybe uh, 10 or 12 years ago. So. So they gave me $1 million and I convinced the Americans to stop bombing for a little while. I told them we could use the time to find Osama, but really it was so those Arab dogs could escape to Pakistan. Then I went to the ISI, the Pakistan Intelligence Agency, and said, give me $500,000 and I'll give you Al Qaeda. They pulled a gun and told me to get out of their face. Zaman laughed. You see, they don't play this game. You can't buy them. And, and I knew when I was reading this, I knew exactly what was gonna happen. And sure enough, two paragraphs down, uh, uh, Gopal describes that uh, uh, Zaman got killed by a suicide bomber. And what happened was because the United States could not do what they did in Vietnam and just send in hundreds of thousands of troops, they couldn't do it for domestic reasons. They had to depend on this whole layer of, of informants and, and so on. And for instance, if they had, had who was going to build their military bases? It was, it, it was this layer. Who was going to provide them uh, with supplies and protect the truck convoys that were going from, let's say, Kandahar to some, uh, to some uh, uh, Air Force base? It was, it was this layer. And some of them were charging one to $2,000 per truck to get these convoys through. They were charging the, the truck drivers. At the same time, then what they did, if another, if another one of these uh, warlords or, or commanders was developing his own links, and it was always his, his own links with the US and was a potential uh, financial and economic threat, they would go to the US and say, hey, look, that guy's Taliban. And then they'd have that guy arrested and likely is not shipped off to Guantanamo. Also, then they use their position to start to steal land, either from their fellow uh, uh, landlords or also from peasants. Also, they use their position. Uh, another book talks about the transport mafia linked up with the drug smugglers. So this was the type of capitalist class that US imperialism and European imperialism through NATO this was the type of capitalist class that they were that they were developing there, and um, it, it's kind of it's kind of like the paradigm or or, or the dynamics on steroids of the of the 
permanent revolution, the fourth, the um, the fourth theory of the permanent revolution, linked with the degeneration of capitalism in the 21st century. The two of them combined. Now the question to me, and uh, which seems to be foremost, you know, Afghanistan is one of the very few countries in the world where the great majority of the population is rural and it has a very small proletariat. And so it seems to me also with capitalism being unable to unite the whole nation because of the extreme ethnic uh, uh, tribal divisions, how can the situation be resolved? And it seems to me, and I'd be interested in hearing the comrades, especially Amman from Iran, hear their views, that it has to be resolved on a regional basis. And in particular, you have one powerful working class that's in motion there, that's the Iranian working class. And it would seem to me that they would have an extremely potentially important role to play throughout the region, including in particular in, in Afghanistan and would have to be linked directly with the question, uh, number one, the national question. And, and I mean this directly and openly. And number two, the question of uh, women's liberation. Oh, it's Joe. Uh, yes. I just wanted to ask one Sorry, John, John from Britain. Thank yeah. you. I think John Ryman has partially answered it, but I'd like to ask one question. Who are these NGOs we keep hearing about? In this country, you think of NGOs as being Save the Children or the Red Cross, etc. But in Afghanistan, they seem to have developed a very sinister role, which doesn't quite fit in with, if you like, the charities that you know I've just mentioned. So could somebody explain who the NGOs are and who's financing them. I'll leave right. it at that. Thanks, John. Yes, uh, next I've got uh, Leslie from uh, Britain. Yeah, just a tremendous inspiring uh, contributions from the um, from the comrades. Um, and obviously we've seen the total failure of, of world capitalism to develop any uh, economic and social conditions in Afghanistan. Um, it was really heartening to hear about how widespread the protests of women and young people are. And obviously the poorest in Afghan society have, uh, you know, including women, have been used and abused for many years um, by landlords, warlords, Taliban, a whole variety of invaders. Um, so I've got a couple of questions. Um, it was interesting what Farouk said about the real first of all education. Um, I think many of us have had the impression in the in the West that the uh, gains in education have been more limited to um, women in the cities and more middle class women. And hearing the contribution, I'm not sure how true that is or not. Um, and another question, which has been uh, partly answered by um, Luke again, is um, about the, uh, the links with the uh, Pakistani comrades, especially with uh, Afghan people, obviously personal links there. Um, but how can we further develop these links and solidarity in our different parts of the, the world? And... Obviously, that includes the issue of Iran, because given the circumstances there, although the workers are on the move, again, it's very difficult to, to um, you know, make practical and open uh, links. So I'd be interested in maybe some further comment from a man about that as well. So uh, thank you, comrades, very much for your contribution. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Um, I'm calling Adam next. Adam, um, could you introduce yourself? I'm not sure where you're from. <laughs> Good morning, comrades. My name is Adam Schills. I'm a member of the International Socialism Project in Chicago. I wanted to make two points. Firstly, I think we have to be cautious on the scale of US imperialism's defeat. I think we should see it as a setback, 
but I don't see it as a historic defeat for the following reasons, four of them. Number one, imperialism did not, US imperialism did not enter Afghanistan in 2001 for classic imperialist reasons, the seizure of raw materials, the need to get markets. It entered for political revenge following 9-11. It's rather different than classic imperialism. Secondly, the scale of the military defeat, it's not like Waterloo or Stalingrad, where a huge army stumbled black, bloody, like Napoleon's battle for Moscow. It's more like the British in Kenya with the Mau Mau rebellion in the 50s, where the imperialists were not able to get their wishes, but you can't say they really came back smashed and bloodied. Thirdly, US imperialism will be able to continue to function on a world scale unimpeded. After Vietnam, both the domestic Vietnam syndrome and a reluctance to intervene hampered the US on a world scale. For example, they weren't able to intervene when the Cubans held, hate, aided the MPA in Angola in 1976, one year later. They had to essentially watch that. Um, so this won't be like that. This won't stop their intervening. Third, fourthly rather, and finally, Afghanistan is not a crucial location for America. Now, having said that, saying it's a setback does not mean it's nothing, does not mean it's zero. We, we don't have to say it's the exact opposite of historic defeat. It's a setback. It's particularly a setback for the reasons comrades have said so well of the rivalry with uh, China, that China will particularly in a, um, be able to go with the Belt and Road Initiative through Afghanistan and for the US not to have a strategic area near its, what's going to be its main rival in the 21st um, century, that is China. My second and final point is building on what John Ryman from Oakland said. That is the question of a regional perspective. What will be the, Afghanistan obviously has a very weak working class. What will be the unit of revolution? Will not be Afghanistan as a country, but will be the broader subcontinent bringing into play the Pakistani and the very powerful Indian proletariat. I come out of the fourth international tradition where we put it a bit flamboyantly or exuberantly for a red subcontinent. Many of the comrades on this call, I think, come out of the militant tradition that put it for a united socialist. Middle East, United Socialist subcontinent. It seems to me that perspective of a regional revolution, of a United Socialist subcontinent, bringing in the strength of the Indian proletariat and how the Indian proletariat can pull behind it, not just other oppressed groups in India, because it's a centralized, organized, cohesive collective force, but can pull in other elements in the region, such as the oppressed in Afghanistan is a very relevant one. Thank you, comrades. Yeah, thank you very much, Adam. Uh, useful points. Um, I'm calling on David now from, well, from South Africa originally, and from America now. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Roger, but uh, even more thanks to the uh, comrades, particularly, you know, who, those who are right on the border or have had direct experience, you know, the whole, um, the, all the issues come alive when you listen to you. And I hope uh, we who, you know, maybe feel a little more fluent in English are not dominating you. And, and, and please, you know, please put your hands up too. We'd love to hear from a wider range on, on a number of issues. I'd like to make 
uh, five points, if I may. First of all, this is a critical point at which we can look at the uh, balance of forces internationally, because there's no doubt that America has had a defeat. American imperialism has had to retreat, and it's uh, astonishing how, what can I say, how humiliating at points that that has that defeat has uh, has been. Um, on the other hand, you know, I'm in a small town in America and no one talks about it at all. It's not even a matter for discussion. Not even 9-11, which happened yesterday, is a matter for discussion at all among extended family and, and, and the rest. So these things seem very far away from the American heartland. And uh, in a way that insulates Biden, who's not under huge uh, pressures at the moment. I just raise that because the politics, we need to be quite clear about the politics. The politics right now in American politics it's not that there's a sense of defeat, rather that a mistake was made and we'll make some kind of turn and leave it to the politicians, they'll do something. Now, American imperialism is deeply irrational. I think we need to face this fact, although the most intelligent wings of the uh, ruling class here uh, are thinking through uh, the balance of interests in any particular point, and there, there are many theories out there about how they should conduct the, you know, their foreign policy, there's zigzags, their defeats, there's every possible permutation on the card which is not rational. Sometimes, as Adam has said, uh, you know, they go in purely for uh, political revenge. And even then, they cannot define what that revenge will be because they overstayed. Uh, so many strategists have said they have overstayed uh, their um, initial strategy, which was to get bin Laden and to uh, smash Al Qaeda. And yet, that all happened. And yet they still stayed on and, and stayed on. Uh, and that has actually led to a, a, a spiraling set of problems, which now they've had to pull the plug on and to retreat with uh, you, you know, some, uh, some humiliation. So they couldn't define the objective. Even they were, when they felt they'd achieved their objective, there seems to be a certain um, momentum in imperialism that once you've you've established a, 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 a sort of stronghold, you know, you build on it and extend it as happened in Iraq, even though it's actually spiraling uh, downwards and, and actually they're losing. And then you can have very impetuous things, uh, incidents such as Indonesia in 1965, uh, organizing with the military there to have a massacre of 1 million left-wingers, socialists, trade unionists, liberals, Anyone who was left of the uh, extreme right, uh, you know, that's that's what was done. Of course, I've denied it a hundred times, but that's how Ameri American goes. At the same time, proclaiming democracy everywhere they go. And if we know from, you know, anyone from South Africa will tell you, America has never stood against apartheid and for democracy in South Africa. In fact, they sold out uh, on the. Uh, you know, on the on leading people in the underground, so that the security police in South Africa uh, could uh, arrest Nelson Mandela and the like. So they've always been on the side of of reaction, and yet Biden has launched a campaign that is going to be his trademark to say that he's standing for the defense of democracy internationally. But right now, I've said that they're not doing that. He's actually denounced that idea uh, recently. So there's a tangle of confusion about American imperialist interests abroad. And we will see all kinds of, of, of strange things. Now, this does create a vacuum. A number of comrades have mentioned this and that we're looking to see, you know, what's going to happen in Iran. Is uh, China going to intervene and, and the like? The second point I'd like to make is the weakness of the state. Because the Americans defined the uh, objective they had as purely military, um, they tried to build up an uh, Afghan uh, military, but they couldn't constitute a political center. There was no, there was, the, the bourgeoisie was too weak uh, to be able to stand on its own two feet. John has mentioned the treacherous nature of, of that uh, bourgeoisie. And so the entire bureaucracy and the entire political leadership depended on handouts from America. And actually in the end, the Taliban has actually benefited from that because they taxed all kinds of projects. Uh, someone, I think it was uh, John, raised the question about these NGOs. They're funded largely by American money, but of course they're doing important work such as educating young girls, providing food for, for needy families and, and, and the like. 
because they're trying to show the depth of American, uh, shall we say, to, to stable, uh, to efforts to stabilize, uh, to stabilize the regime. And, and the Taliban is, in a sense, going to have to come back they, because they used to get a share of something like 50% or more of, of these projects. And they, uh, you, you know, that's, that's going to be something that America is going to be offering them. And they're going to, it, it seems as though some deals will be made in the end, which will lead to a treacherous recognition. I, I predict that they will, in the end, recognize the Taliban uh, government, despite whatever they say that they're doing right now. Uh, the amount of money flowing, we mentioned the three trillion. Just remember that most of that three trillion came right back to America. It was actually a transfer within Washington from the state to multinational corporations and contractors on a massive scale. So massive that they had to have in a special uh, auditor general uh, uh, dedicated to Afghan, Afghanistan to find out what on earth happened to their money. And that was 10 years ago. And just billions literally disappeared without a trace. And they didn't know what was what is happening. That's the very opposite of uh, efficiency on the part of American capitalism. But that was a catastrophic state. In other words, they couldn't constitute a political center. Because they couldn't constitute a political center, they couldn't really give political leadership to the army, which were, until the last year or two was actually led by the Americans and, the, uh, and NATO when they went into battle. They didn't design their own uh, battle uh, strategies. The third point is about the nature of the Taliban. I think our comrades have raised the fact that this is the most reactionary movement which has uh, come to power. Um, some estimates in terms of surveys made before you know, the Taliban have come to power indicate that they command about 10% of the population support. So how did they have such a stunning victory as just walking for almost walking from uh, city to city uh, taking over? Because they had the support of Pakistan and they had support uh, in, in, in certain uh, strata to be, and they allowed the decentralization of control to allow youth just to march into the cities and to take it. And of course the state knew that in the end there'd be treachery from above, and that is proven, and that uh, they would just die and be slaughtered uh, without uh, any, any cause, and they wanted their families uh, to survive. So we, we're now looking to see what character, everyone is debating the character of a, of a Taliban government, and already they've answered it. It's, it. They've put in, I think, six people in the government now are on the international wanted list for uh, participation in one or the other, in the uh, attack on the uh, World Trade Center. So the, some of them have even, one of them particularly was uh, released from Guantanamo. So America has tried its very best. It set out the objective of breaking Al-Qaeda and, and the network, which uh, led to 9-11. And the humiliation at the moment is amazing, although it's, it's, it's almost neutral because no one's mentioning it, that these very people who had planned the attack you know, on the, the World Trade Center are now in fact, in, in, in government uh, in uh, Afghanistan. We're seeing a, an outpouring uh, of, of, of violence against women. Uh, we've heard about the demonstrations. On the other hand, we've seen the terrible beating that journalists have had, so much so that they've all ended up, uh, two of those journalists who, who reported on the demonstrations are now in hospital, and that uh, women are, uh, are here now in, in interviews are allowed to go back uh, to practice as nurses, for instance, but not to uh, touch a, a man or not to be involved in any discussion whatsoever with uh, males in the hospital. And, and that is a catastrophic uh, setback you know, for, for women, which we do not celebrate. In fact, we denigrate and we fight against that. So we find now, the fourth point I'd make is that there is a spreading now in a sense, someone mentioned about 10 jihadist movements, and we see that throughout, the, uh, throughout Africa at the moment, you know, there's a rise of uh, jihadism. Uh, some people say, well, it's just the name that people are taking, but the practice is of uh, beheading people on large scale, massacring villages and the like, all in the, uh, all in the name of religion. So it does, it is a, a trend which, which we could see something similar 
uh, in Africa, where the states are absolutely rotten, the troops are not paid, the bureaucracy has got billions and taking even more, it's something similar uh, to the government in Afghanistan and is now being threatened as in Mozambique and in West Africa um, by a rising mood from uh, below, not necessarily support from jihadism, the point made about the Taliban is if you can have a minority which is well-structured, has a tight ideology, and has enough access to arms, you can dominate an area and establish a base of power and actually fight against a very rotten uh, military and even have success. The last point I'd like to make is in relation to the role of the Chinese bureaucracy. It's e very evident right now that the Taliban government is not committed, it it's doesn't even have a concept of the military, it has no concept of a health system or an education system or anything else. It's just the doctor no, the doctor no on everything. It, uh, it, it cannot say yes to anything which is, uh, which is uh, progressive. This opens, in a sense, an opportunity for the Chinese bureaucracy with its advanced technology in terms of controlling and, and spying and using in, uh, artificial intelligence to track people's conversations. Uh, to be able to build a dictatorship, to turn the Taliban from a ramshackle movement into a, uh, into a dictatorship of, of some note. And I want to ask whether that's actually you know, on, on the cards. The last point I'd like to make in, just in relation to that is that the, the talk that we've heard, the spelling out of how women are attending universities and prepared to go at five o'clock in the morning and to stay up till 10 o'clock at night is truly inspiring. And it does show that the youth, women, and sections of the working people are really determined to fight. Many say to fight to the death right now to be able to eliminate the Taliban and the forces of reaction you know, in, that, in that region. It reminds me a little of the mood I had when I was teaching in Dar es Salaam, where people were prepared to, every, everyone put their name on a, on a desk or, or on, on a, place at the library, they were so determined they were going to be able to sit and actually read books in quiet and uh, be able to study. It's a marvelous attitude and we do need to give everything we can to support the education and the political education of that strata. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, thank you. And uh, we have one more comrade who's uh, indicated they want to speak. That's comrade uh, Jim from uh, Britain. If there's any other comrades who want to speak, uh, it'll have to be fairly brief now. Please, um, you know, raise your hand. Otherwise, Jim will be the last uh, speaker before we get the replies from from the other comrades. Um, Jim. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can I thank, in particular, the three main speakers at the beginning? I thought it was absolutely brilliant contributions, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and also, obviously, a number of the points. Uh, it really, as David just said, really kind of lifts it and makes it come to to life. Certainly for people such as myself in Britain. Um, I just want to make a, a comment uh, uh, on a couple of points people have made and then uh, just uh, some questions really to ask. Personally, I think this is an historic defeat for Western imperialism. Uh, um, I mean, it crystallizes a long drawn out weakness that we have seen over decades. And it's a parallel with the Soviet Union's a defeat also in Afghanistan, which was a factor in the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, what I know uh, Adam in particular said, well, it's not classic imperialism. Imperialism can intervene, I think, for many different reasons uh, 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 and so on, and revenge is, is one of them. I, I think the parallel with Kenya that he mentioned, I would disagree with, I have to say. Uh, um, I mean, what happened, of course, in Kenya after the Kikuyu uh, rebellion over land theft uh, um, was that the British uh, did a deal with the Kikuyu uh, uh, leaders uh, um, and handed over power so they could maintain their influence, even to the extent of sending in uh, military to support a post-independence government when it was threatened by the local uh, military uh, coup. There's nothing like that in, uh, in Afghanistan. The imperialists are scrabbling for influence, it seems to, uh, seems to me. And I don't think there's any appetite in the West for a future intervention in, uh, in such countries. I mean, we've seen in Britain of headlines of uh, they died in vain 
in terms of the hundreds of, uh, of troops that went to, uh, to Afghanistan. And it seems to me that imperialism now, Western imperialism, uh, can no longer establish a great stability in a whole range across the world, which was able to do post Second World War in Germany and Japan for a lot of the reasons, particularly that uh, uh, have been mentioned by John and, uh, and by others. And the weakness of the uh, bourgeoisie in those countries means that the, as one of the speakers pointed out, that essentially Western imperialism is having to react and accept reactionary regimes, who, which they can't control, but they never they have to accept as long as they have uh, repressive actions within their own countries to bring greater stability. Obviously, American imperialism isn't finished. <laughs> it will, uh, uh, it's not over, but I think it's been greatly damaged by what has happened in the, uh, in the last month, uh, uh, and it will reorientate and, uh, and so on and, and judge. Uh, um, and you look at British imperialism, it's sending its aircraft carrier around the world uh, uh, and so on as a sign of impotence, really. Uh, uh, when you do that and it ca can't actually organize an airlift properly in Afghanistan. Um, the points that were made, I think, about and the hope and the support for seeds of opposition for the Taliban, I, I'd wonder if in their concluding remarks, some of the speakers could, uh, could develop this a little bit more. And also the question of the regional powers. It seems to me the regional powers do not want instability in Afghanistan, but they also do not want a strong Afghan centralized government uh, in any sense as a rival. And so we've seen the regional jostling of power. And uh, I'd be very interested to see what people think of the impact that will have in developments within both Pakistan and Iran of uh, the developments in Afghanistan. And the point that David and others have made about China and the intervention, I think, are very pertinent. But there is also a question I'd like to ask, which is that, of course, China has massive suppression of its own Muslim population of the Uyghurs. And how are the different factions in the Taliban going to respond to that? Are they going to ignore it? Or is that an Achilles heel in terms of Islamic solidarity? And so my final question <laughs> uh, is I'd be very interested if people have a perspectives on what they think the situation will be over the six, nine months, a year, a couple of years and so on. Uh, within Afghanistan itself and the developments, but also with the regional powers uh, uh, and so on in, in the area and, and the impact that will have with them and the wider geopolitical things. But uh, finally, thank you very much. It's been a very illuminating uh, uh, talk this afternoon. Uh, right. Um, thank you, Jim. I completely agree with that. It's been uh, an absolutely superb discussion. And uh, I'm going to ask the, uh, the speakers to, to respond. I think um, if it's OK with them, I think in reverse order. So uh, Aman, Farouk, and then Hamid, if that's OK. And uh, if you could try to limit your uh, response to maximum five minutes uh, each. Um, I would just want to make one very quick point be uh, before you reply. Um, I think that uh, the point that Adam raised, one of the points that Adam raised is a crucial significance, and that's the uh, regional context. Um, the, the slogan and the um, objective of um, a socialist federation of the region is I think of uh, something which we, we have to put foremost, not just on our under in, in relation to our understanding, but our program as well. We have many comrades here from uh, from Pakistan, we have comrades here from Sri Lanka. We have comrades here, I think, from uh, Bangladesh too. We have to um, uh, actively pursue the the uh, the building of links uh, throughout the subcontinent. Of course, it's in difficult in the present conditions in Afghanistan itself. But uh, as uh, Adam said, the enormous power and strength and militancy and cohesion of the Indian proletariat is a factor which uh, we must always put to the forefront. We've ha had a situation uh, which we mentioned many times, but a situation in, in the last three or four years where three times we had the biggest demonstrations, the biggest strikes in uh, working class history on a world scale. Strikes of um, 35 crore, 350 million 
uh, sorry, 250 million, 25 crore uh, that, that participated, including one uh, only uh, about a year ago. Uh, we had the uh, the siege of the capital city by um, 300,000, three lakh um, farmers. Uh, we've had uh, you know, it, just incredible displays of strength. And what is lacking is, um, is the political um, uh, leadership and the political concentration to be able to give that a, um, a program and uh, to take that movement to fruition. And it's, uh, it is a, um, not just a regional, it's an internationalist um, uh, uh, task, which is on the agenda of uh, all the comrades, uh, all of us here, and particularly the comrades in the, in the region. And um, I would also just like to make a final appeal. Comrades who, uh, who are not on our mailing list, um, please take this opportunity, either through the contacts that you made already that uh, got you here, um, but also uh, by giving me your email address. You can uh, address it to me privately, if you like, or in the chat. Uh, some comrades have done that already, but I hope other comrades will too. Uh, we have meetings like this uh, every week, and uh, equally, the, you know, they've given us an absolutely unique and irreplaceable perspective and insight into uh, the revolution as it's developing on a global scale. So first I'll ask Comrade Aman, are you ready? Yes, thank you, Roger. Um, as you said, a, a, a lot of good points were made, uh, uh, and, I, and I actually definitely benefited from them. Uh, in five minutes, uh, I think all I can do is just uh, answer, well, mention a couple of points very, very briefly. Uh, uh, let me re-emphasize, I think uh, the issue is not, as I mentioned, is, is a major issue. And I think not only for the people in the region, but across the world. Uh, the situation of what has happened with the US, irrespective of how we define it, puts a lot of points on the agenda of the comrades with regard to US and similarly with the other NATO countries. Uh, this position um, of the change, or if you like, not only in the politics, uh, but of the, I think to a large scale, uh, the end of the notion of military answers to the Middle East and the war-like uh, atmosphere in, in the whole area. Uh, I think that actually has uh, repercussions, not only in the region, but for all, all the comrades everywhere. Uh, one point which was mentioned uh, with regard to the situation, I think also from the point of view of the uh, situation. For example, uh, I'll just give you a couple of examples of what we have been seeing uh, in, in, in Iran. Uh, which probably could give some views of this. Uh, what we have done, uh, and when I said the answer is not uh, literally uh, a country, but it's a more a regional issue, is not a question of a political party of a regional issue, but I think the actual way that the bourgeoisie rules is largely an issue which is regional. The question of a stability, um, the question is what do you consider stable? Pakistan stable as a state? Um, do we, um, Pakistan has nuclear power. Um, Iran stable? Iraq stable? The definition of stability is also one we can think about. Is the bourgeoisie agreeing to a rule of effectively its own class and redefining what we call stability? And I think the issue of stability is different now to what we actually call probably stability 10 years ago. Second point, which I think would be important to mention is, for example, uh, when I said about Iran, um, the Iranian bourgeoisie uh, ruling parties uh, have continuously used the issue of racism against Afghan people in Iran. Uh, Afghan people are not only not given the same rights, but even the right of citizenship of Afghan people in Iran is denied. Um, if an Iranian woman marries an Afghan man, their child does not have a birth certificate, cannot go to school. Uh, so the idea of looking at the issue of racism and the division that uh, what uh, bourgeoisie does is the same everywhere with harsher implications in different places. Uh, one of the issues that has been risen in Iran is, as far as we are concerned, I think for the working class, 
is to actually say, not only we don't accept this, which they have been doing, but openly actually coming in support of recognition of workers and against the division. And um, just to mention this, uh, workers at half that uh, on their strike about 10 days ago, uh, immediately almost after the Taliban was announced uh, to have taken complete control. One of their slogans was, every Afghan is not only welcome here, but our heart beats with you. And uh, we recognize the rights of Afghan people, whether in Iran or in Afghanistan. Uh, solidarity from bottom up, that, that's what I mean in terms of building solidarity and action. Um, support for the movement that is in uh, Afghanistan at the moment. I think recognition of the fact that it doesn't matter embryonic, small, large, um, or how widespread, et cetera. I think it's a deep movement within Afghanistan, which is actually fighting against Taliban. The way it presents itself, the way it actually manifests itself may be different. Like all the movements, sometimes it's hidden, sometimes it's open to the public to see. But there is a huge movement against Afghan. And in this movement, uh, the bourgeoisie, again, is trying to put this answer. Uh, Masoud in Panjshir and other bourgeois are providing one answer, one alternative to Taliban. And there is another alternative that doesn't actually recognize, even Masoud does not even, has not even said that they want to have any form of secular, secularism in the region. The idea of redefining people as Muslims doesn't wash in Middle East anymore. There is no such thing as this is a Muslim approach. It doesn't exist. The class has taken, the actual class struggle is the main issue. And recognizing that means that parties that actually rely on gathering people under the name of Islam is another alternative of bourgeoisie. And as soon as that is recognized, I know in the media, in the uh, general internationally, we tend not to see this. But it is not true that when people in Afghanistan go actually and stand up and say, we don't want Taliban, and a woman actually holds a banner and says, it is the right of every woman to be recognized as a man and as a human being. Uh, and the fact that they do not actually recognize the issue of religion uh, as determining factor, I think is showing a change in the whole area. And this is, I think, what we have to rely on. Uh, class struggle, solidarity in action bottom up, recognition of refugees, welcoming them and fighting against individual states everywhere against recognition of Taliban, irrespective of whether the US has forces there or doesn't have forces there. And there is no different Taliban. This is the same Taliban, but the Taliban of today, the same as the fascists of 1940 are no different from the fascists of today, but obviously they act according to the current scenario. Taliban of today, there is no democratic Taliban. There is no new Taliban. It's the same Taliban running the party of today. That's it, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Comrade Aman. Um, Farouk, are you ready? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, all the comrades. Uh, I think there are uh, four points I would briefly touch in these five minutes. Uh, first of all, I think, uh, let me also propose uh, a conference of the left uh, from Iran, uh, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, uh, at least to have an initial conference online maybe, and of course, supported by our comrades across the world, uh, we badly need such an initiative. Second thing I want to uh, say is that I fully agree with comrade uh, Aman, what he said is uh, in his initial uh, 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 lead off, uh, we need to recognize huge changes that have taken place uh, he pointed out a few of them. I want to also touch a couple of more. For instance, Afghanistan was one of the countries that was really urbanizing. Uh, the urbanization rate was very high. When I went to Kabul for it, um, soon after the overthrow of Kabul, uh, Taliban 2001, population of Kabul was less than half a million. Presently, it is perhaps 6 million. There is no census for many years, many decades actually but these are some of the uh, figures that are available. So from half a million, it went up to 6 million. Same is the case with other major cities, Herat, uh, mazar sharif uh, even Jalalabad and so on. So urbanization is taking place. Secondly, the money that came, um, you know, whatever was spent there, 
it it gave birth to to a service sector not there is no by and large there is no industrialization it was mainly into the services sector uh, comrade aman pointed out media which was one of it no doubt uh, and also i think the the most significant uh, change was in relation to women i think th their struggle usually the academics uh, and intellectuals they they reduce the women struggle to sort of certain very set things uh, when they are on the roads when they are forming parties when they are contesting elections in fact i learned from the afghan comrades our women comrades there that look the women struggle the most important women struggle is when a girl in the morning is arguing with her brothers and father that i i will be going to school and when she is fighting for her right to work that is you know a definition they have in afghanistan so that was the most uh, uh, you know uh, in, in important change uh, that was not there and then the demographic fact that comrade amon pointed out a huge chunk of the population has grown up or even born after the uh, 911 period second thing was like uh, you know a lot of talk about china and uh, us imperialism and so on i won't really go into that interesting debate uh, to be honest i don't have uh, my own uh, developed viewpoint on it i i want to wait on i want to look some more developments uh, but of course the debates are important uh, last thing that i would like to elaborate more is the character of taliban the perspective uh i think uh, we have already seen some of the expressions of taliban i think there was no disagreement here that there are no new taliban all the talk about and all this effort to rebrand taliban was actually to to sort of make them acceptable the thing is china russia eu usa everybody wants to recognize them it was the speed as comrade aman pointed out that has upset the whole plan everybody wants to recognize them for their own interests that was why perhaps we were having this whole rebranding of taliban but as one of our afghan comrades uh, pointed out that look the the taliban have only horns they have no head that is to say they only know the use of force they only know the use of their barbarism they do not have modern ideas to deal with a changing afghanistan it is repeatedly uh, afghans liberal left every kind of people men women on social media they are pointing out they are saying it that it's not taliban who have changed it is the afghanistan that has changed what is not being recognized by taliban is the fact that afghanistan has changed now that is both a hope and tragedy because you know uh the way they have lost some of the gains they made last 20 years to their hard struggles uh, they are really at risk have been lost in many ways uh, but also this is the hope uh, this is the hope you know uh, that we can count on for the future and most important thing uh, uh, will it last will taliban stay on uh, i think if if the governments are uh, recognizing them uh, you know from usa to russia which is most likely if we do not oppose it if in the in the absence of a solidarity movement it will happen if it happens if it happens then they may last another maybe 15 to 20 years uh if there is a solidarity movement if there is a resistance is if there is an intervention then uh, this regime may be unstable of course there are many internal contradictions it's not the same taliban in the sense of the central control there are many factions at the mega level and micro level uh, there are many contradictions uh, already disagreements uh last two three days uh, both in afghanistan and pakistan people have been pointing out that mulla brother was uh, injured shot injured by a rival faction during the formation of the government where isi pakistani isi had to intervene so these are just the indications 
but as we know, as we know, I mean, you know, uh, politics is complicated. Uh, very strong, solid perspectives can go wrong. And sometimes very unseen, very unexpected developments can uh, prove us wrong. Uh, but for now, I think uh, a lot is in the air. It depends on, uh, on, the, on, on a lot of factors. On the one hand, uh, from their viewpoint, things are going in their favor. They can consolidate and uh, stabilize. Uh, on the other hand, the hope is the resistance emerging within Afghanistan. And if we are able to build a solidarity movement around that on a, at least regional scale uh, and to some extent global scale, then the things can be uh, you know, upset for uh, and, and, and go in the favor of Afghan people and the working classes. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, Farooq. And finally, uh, Hamid, please. Uh, I would uh, like to uh, speak upon uh, two or three points. First of all, uh, I would like to uh, say that uh, Taliban didn't defeat it, didn't defeat the American imperialism. And as, uh, in same as in history, we understand that uh, the jihadists, the dollar mujahideen, didn't defeat the USSR. Uh, this is the same phenomenon uh, from which we can understand that the uh, internal uh, contradiction and, uh, uh, and their organic uh, incapability of uh, forwarding the, the system uh, is the basic uh, reason of their demise. Whether that is the uh, United States or it is. Uh, the start of the demise of American imperialism or uh, neoliberalism. Uh, I will uh, uh, contradict uh, one comrade said uh, that uh, it's just a fact fact. I think uh, we should uh, uh, we should not make any analogy uh, in the past century with the latest defeat of America as uh, today. The whole capitalist system is incapable of going forward. And it has lost its, its all capabilities of development and progressive nature. Uh, today, as they had in uh, last uh, century, they had uh, a vast area of China where they introduced and they um, and they. Uh, export their uh, the techniques and means of production to keep the capitalism uh, producing uh, the commodities and goods and going ahead. But uh, with the start of this new century, there is no space for capitalism or for capitalism to explore any new area in which they can invest and they can uh, get out, uh, uh, rid of the, uh, the, the inherent uh, recession or the incapability of the, uh, they are facing the great problem of uh, the profit of rate of ratio. They can, they can not attain the same uh, ratio as, as they had in previous uh, century. So I think. Uh, it is not uh, a great uh, defeat, yes, but it is the start of a great defeat and unfolding of the, uh, the neoliberalism, and its, its defeat is now unfolding on world scale level. It started from Afghanistan, and it will go beyond uh, the limit. As uh, we uh, see that uh, the defeat of America in Afghanistan, its repercussions on Pakistani state and in Pakistani government Nowadays, there is a lot of uh, conflict and conflictions during uh, in the uh, Pakistani state, and there will be, uh, I think, will be a, a, a change in uh, Pakistani government sooner or later uh, due to this change in Afghanistan. And we saw the first time from 1949 till now that uh, the NATO, uh, the NATO. Is uh, uh, taking the effects of 
the American defeat in Afghanistan. May the European Union, the Germany and the France, etc., are uh, separating their ways from America. They are obviously saying that America is in is an untrusted friend. So it's uh, 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 repercussions in early stage is so vast, and we we can see the these uh, uh, snowball effects will be affecting the whole capitalist system and the whole world uh, very soon. And uh, at the same time, I will uh, uh, agree with uh, Comrade Aman that uh, Taliban in 90s and Taliban now are the same. Their brutality, their uh, fundamentalist thoughts, and uh, their uh, relation to the ancient past, they have uh, no program for the Afghan uh, people, for the Afghan uh, working class, or for the Afghan economy, are building the Afghan state on capitalist basis. Is American, is a power like America, uh, couldn't build a, a state on capitalist basis or new uh, liberal method. So Taliban, who has just the program of charity, they uh, cannot build a state uh, uh, in Afghanistan or can uh, establish some social institution. So uh, I will also. Um, uh, uh, respond uh, to Silvana's uh, question about uh, the demonstrations of the women. There are three kinds of uh, demonstrations in Kabul or, or across the Afghanistan. Uh, one kind uh, of uh, uh, demonstrations are for the women's rights. They are behind the Taliban forces as uh, uh, Farouk mentioned uh, from, uh, from taking day of the control of the Taliban on 17th of August, they defied, they faced very bravely the Taliban. That uh, movement is basically a revolutionary uh, content that has a revolutionary content in its nature. Uh, but uh, at the other hand, some demonstrations were there uh, from female which were demonstrating for the uh, Panjshir resistance, the National Resist Resistance uh, Front, uh, which I think uh, is uh, a reactionary resistance because they have explicitly uh, asked from America and India the help of uh, money and weapons, and uh, they were ready to become a proxy for uh, America and uh, for uh, India. And uh, the third uh, demonstration, um, we saw the, the, the girls or the women in the burqa. Those were basically, uh, most of them uh, were Taliban. Uh, they were wearing uh, burqas. And uh, second, uh, those girls who wanted to continue their studies, the Taliban promised them that uh, uh, come into burqas and uh, come to, uh, to our demonstration, then we will let you go to your university, colleges, or school. That is, uh, that was a blackmailing style of the uh, Taliban uh, because they do not have uh, any uh, sympathy in all over uh, the uh, Afghanistan. Uh, but uh, this uh, defeat, this uh, retreat of uh, American imperialism and uh, with their evacuation, their moral moral are uh, temporarily very high. We can see its uh, repercussions in across the urban line here in Pakistani cities and areas. The fundamentalists are uh, really um, rejoicing uh, their this victory. But uh, we, uh, as a comrade, we. Uh, every time you know, and we have to and we are saying the positive aspects of uh, any even any reactionary phenomenon so uh, we have a strong uh, comrades and uh, uh, 
very uh, good uh, uh, people who were uh, who were in the uh, movement of the revolution, and they are uh, uh, they are in number in millions in number. Uh, so we are uh, we are uh, we hope that uh, a strong support will emerge um, during this reactionary uh, and the black process. Thank you. For well, thank you very much, Comrade David, and thanks, thanks to all the speakers, thanks to everybody who participated. Um, I think we had comrades from seven countries who, who uh, took part. I think this discussion has been in the best uh, traditions of WIN. We do meet every week. Next week, uh, we're discussing the environment. Uh, comrade um, Jim Hollinshead, who I think is still here, will be uh, leading off. And um, I hope to see you then. Thanks, comrades. Bye-bye.